extension educator in Fairfield County. And she's also a member of our, our Ohio Woodland Stewards team. So she suggested this, um, this wildflower hike. We might've wrangled her and do it a little bit as well, but we're very excited that she agreed to, to, to do this talk. And I think, like we said earlier, the weather's perfect to stay inside today and um, have nice thoughts about spring flowers. So Carrie, I'll turn it over to you and I will stop sharing. Thanks for being here. All right, thank you very much for having me. Let me get my screen shared here. How does that look? Looks good, you're good to go. All right, thank you. Okay, so as Marnie said, uh, my name is, is Carrie Brown. I am the ANR educator in Fairfield County, which is just southeast of Columbus. Um, and today we are going to take a virtual tour of our native spring ephemeral wildflowers. And we're gonna take a, a close look at what is guiding plant development. Um, I wanna preface this by saying that I am not a botanist, but I am a passionate woodland owner <clears throat> and I spend a lot of time in the woods, especially this time of year. So I'm really excited to share this passion with you all today. I'm running a little slow here. There we go. All right, so spring is a, it's a special time of the year to be in the woods. Uh, many of our woody plants are still deep in their winter slumber, um, but there's magic happening, and that magic is happening on the forest floor. So, um, and that comes in the form of our spring ephemeral wildflowers. So what is a spring ephemeral wildflower? Well, the, the definition of ephemeral is uh, lasting a very short time. Um, and wildflower isn't quite as easily defined as it's a bit of a generic term. The dictionary tells us that a wildflower is a flower that is um, uncultivated variety, uh, growing freely without human intervention. Um, but just going by this definition, grasses, for instance, would be included as they do produce flowers. Um, but today we're not gonna be talking about grasses. Uh, today we're going to define wildflowers as the showy blooms that emerge from the forest floor as winter departs and spring enters. So putting those two pieces of the, the puzzle together, our focus is on the showy wildflowers that are out for just a short time in the spring. So spring ephemerals are, are unique because they occupy a very narrow blooming window. This is a time after the soil begins to warm, but before the tree canopy fills. Um, and because of this lack of tree canopy, at least 50% of the sunlight is reaching the forest floor. Now this will decrease considerably beginning in mid-May as trees and shrubs leaf out, hence that term ephemeral. And really you have to give these plants credit um, as they have figured out uh, a way to fill this niche uh, when frankly it is a, a hard time to be a plant. And as a result, they have creative adaptations that allow them to grow when other plants are still dormant. Now it turns out that the timing of this narrow blooming window can shift considerably from year to year, and that is what we're going to take a closer look at first. So you may be familiar with the term phenology, um, also known as nature's calendar. Phenology is the study of the timing of reoccurring biological events, such as plant and insect development. And phenology tells us that specific biological developments, such as the, the blooming of eastern red buds or the emergence of European pine saw flies, um, happens in generally the same order every year, but not necessarily at the same time on the calendar. For instance, uh, today in Columbus, Ohio, uh, which is located in the central part of the state in Franklin County, if we were to take a walk outside, <clears throat> we would notice that the red bud is in full bloom. I'm sorry, the red maple is in full bloom and has been since uh, the beginning of March, so for the past week or so. <clears throat> Cornus moss has been blooming since mid-February and it is approaching full bloom. The star magnolia and the border forsythia 
are just beginning to bloom in the last couple of days. Now, if we were to travel up north to Bryan, Ohio, located in Williams County, we'd notice much less development. Um, the red maple that uh, is in full bloom in Columbus isn't even blooming in Bryan, Ohio. Neither is cornice moss, star magnolia, or border forsythia. So um, much less development in that part of the state. In contrast, if we were to jump down to our most southern county in the state, Lawrence County, we would notice that that red maple is at this point past full bloom, as well as the cornice moss. The star magnolia is approaching full bloom and the border forsythia is in full bloom. So we have further development in the southern part of the state. Furthermore, the Chanticleer calorie pear is approaching full bloom. The PM, PJM rhododendron is in first bloom and the European pine sawfly is beginning to, to hatch. So these are phenological events that have yet to occur in Franklin County or Williams County um, up in um, more northern parts of Ohio. Now this shouldn't surprise us that there's a difference in plant development and insect development when you go um, from north to south in the state. It makes sense that our southern parts of the state are going to warm up before our northern counties. Now let's take a look at uh, how a single location can vary from year to year. So like we said, today in Columbus, Ohio, we have our red maples in full bloom, our cornice moss is almost there, and our border forsythia and our star magnolias are uh, just beginning to bloom. But if we were to go back in time, one year to March 10th, 2022, we would see that our red maples are just beginning to bloom, our cornice moss is just beginning to bloom also, and our star magnolia and border for Cynthia are still dormant, okay? So one year ago today, there was a, quite a bit of a difference in plant development um, compared to what we see outside right now. So what does that tell us? Uh, that tells us that our human-derived calendar isn't driving plant development. The plant development that we are seeing on March 10th this year does not necessarily reflect what we saw last year on March 10th, or what we're going to see next year on March 10th. Nature isn't that simple. So if I were to say star magnolia blooms every year beginning March 5th, you could say, Carrie, that is a false statement. Now this was the case this year in Columbus, Ohio, but last year they didn't begin blooming until March 18th. And in this year alone, star magnolias have long since started blooming down in southern Ohio, and those flower buds are still tight up in northern counties. And that's because our plants aren't watching a calendar. They don't use our system of organizing days. Rather, plant and insect development is based on something else. It's based on the accumulation of heat. Now, scientists have devised a system of measuring and predicting plant and insect development called growing degree days. Now, I put days in quotation marks because I think that this terminology can be misleading because we're not actually counting days. We are counting heat units that are accumulated over a 24 hour period. So a growing degree day really has nothing to do with days. Um, it can be defined as, uh, like we said, a measurement of average heat accumulation. Um, and like we talked about on those previous slides, plant and insects have temperature dependent development. So the accumulation of heat is driving the timing of that development. So a growing degree day, um, that, that heat unit measured over 24 hour period, uh, they're cumulative. So they add up from day to day, <clears throat> and within a 24-hour period, we can accumulate multiple growing degree days. Um, if we have a warm day, we can also accumulate zero growing degree days. If we have a really cool day like today, it just depends on how much heat is accumulated in that 24-hour period. So rather than calling it a day, we're going to call it a unit of heat. 
And that unit of heat is used to estimate growth and development of plants and insects. <clears throat> now, growing degree day is calculated using the accumulation of average daily temperature. And there's a mathematical formula used to figure this out. Now, I was not a math major for a very good reason. So we're not going to get too far into the weeds here. Um, but a growing degree day is found by subtracting the plant's lower base or threshold temperature from the average daily air temperature in a 24-hour period. Now, that base temperature can be defined as the temperature at which an organism's growth stops. And it's going to differ from species to species. If you think about the plants in your vegetable garden, um, a cool season crop such as a cabbage is going to achieve more growth than on a cool spring day than say a warm season crop like a pepper. Um, however, in order to kind of simplify the system, a base temperature of 50 degrees Fahrenheit is often considered acceptable for all plants and animals. And like we've already discussed, each plant species, and I should say also say insect species, requires a specific amount of accumulated heat in order to obtain um, certain life cycle stages. So for instance, let's say that we have an unseasonably warm day, which we've been having quite a few of these this, um, this winter. Um, and we have a, a high of 68 degrees and a low of 42 degrees. To 42 degrees. Now, assuming a base temperature of 50 degrees, we could find the number of growing degree days accumulated by first finding the average temperature. So we're going to add our high temperature with our low temperature, divide by two. And then according to that mathematical formula, we are then going to subtract that base temperature which is 50. So after doing the math, that means that five growing degree days were accumulated in that 24 hour period. And since the since growing degree days are cumulative, that would get added on to what was already accumulated within that year. So if we were already at 50 growing degree days, um, at the end, we're now at 55 growing degree days. Um, so every January 1st, we start at zero, and that number accumulates throughout the year. There are no negative numbers, so on a really cold day, we're not going to lose growing degree days, but there can certainly be days where we don't add anything to that value. Now, each plant species um, requires a specific amount of accumulated heat to obtain um, those certain life cycle stages, and it's possible to assign a value at which development occurs. Uh, for instance, those red maples that we mentioned, they begin blooming at 44 growing degree days. By growing degree day 75, they are in full bloom. And this development can take place um, in the matter of a few days or even longer, depending on the daily average temperature um, and how much heat is accumulating from day to day. Now, of course, there are many other factors that contribute to the timing of plant and insect development besides heat accumulation. Um, nothing in nature can be predicted by a simple mathematical formula. So those other factors may include damage from a late freeze, um, the fertility of the soil that the plant is growing in, whether that plant or insect is located in direct sunlight or shade, uh, changing climate conditions, the presence of weeds that may be competing with that plant for resources, and also excessive precipitation. Now, the Ohio State Phenology Calendar is a great tool that you can use to find out where your location falls in terms of growing degree days. Um, so this is a tool that um, calculates the cumulative growing degree day for the zip code and the date entered. So if I press that red button, show me the calendar, the website will populate a visual of recent plant and insect development with the, cur the current growing degree day in the center. So this is uh, for zip code 43215. So this is uh, a zip code in Columbus, Ohio. And we can see right there in the center that we are at growing de degree day 90. 
and we can look at kind of some chain of events that have happened already. Like we discussed earlier, we've had our first bloom of border forsythia, um, as well as our first bloom of star magnolia. Um, our first bloom of Manitou cherries coming up soon. Up here in the corner, we can see that this happens at growing degree day 93. Um, and the eastern tent caterpillars, growing degree day 92. So that, that egg hatch is coming up very soon. Now, if I press the button that says view full calendar, I can see a listing of developmental stages for an assortment of plants and animals arranged in their phenological order with an indication of the growing degree day required to reach each. Um, this can be a handy tool when gauging the development of pests. For instance, I know that the European pine sawfly eggs hatch at growing degree day 144. Um, I might not be able to actually watch that development, but what I am going to see are the Bradford calorie pairs blooming. Um, that happens at growing degree day 142. So knowing that, I can use the blooming of the Bradford pears as an indicator to begin scouting for European pine sawfly. And that's why this, ca this calendar was created. You'll notice that many of the species uh, including on this calendar, included on this cal calendar are ornamental, and that's because this was created as a tool for the green industry to be able to know and to start looking for those pests. Um, there are many species, of course, that are not on this calendar, um, but you can expand this calendar yourself just by observing what you're seeing outdoors and seeing where it where that lines up with the uh, growing degree day. <clears throat> so if we were to compare where we are today on March 10th, 2023, with where we were on this same day in 2022, and I should notice that this is for Columbus, Ohio, um, we would see that last year we were about 40 growing degree days behind where we are this year. Um, and that can be attributed to the fact that last year we had less accumulated heat at this point. Because of that, we had less plant and insect development on that day. So knowing all of this, it makes sense why we have achieved full bloom of red maple, um, why we are approaching full bloom of cornice moss, and we ha why we have first bloom of star magnolia and uh, border forsythia, because in Columbus we are at growing degree day 90, and each of those require um, a number of growing de degree days that is less than 90. <clears throat> Similarly, it makes sense why we haven't seen any of this happen yet in Bryan, Ohio. Bryan, Ohio is only at growing degree day 33, so we haven't achieved what we need in order to get those developmental stages that we're already seeing in Columbus. And why in Lawrence County, down in that southern county, there's been sufficient accumulated heat um, for the um, uh, Chant Chanticleer calorie pear um, to be in full bloom. Uh, today, we've actually accumulated enough heat for that uh, PJM rhododendron to begin blooming and uh, those European pine sawflies to hatch because we're at green degree day 147 down there. <clears throat> So if we want to take a closer look at that accumulated heat, um, and this is for Columbus, Ohio, uh, we can take a look at how we got to 90, because right now we're at 90, how did we get there? Well, this table shows the growing degree day for each day within January. So like we said, each January 1st, we start at zero. Um, it must have been a pretty cold first day of the year because we did not achieve much in terms of growing degree days that day. Um, you can see that uh, between January 4th and January 16th, um, there was very little accumulated heat uh, because we stayed around 14 green degree days for that entire span. We had a bit of a heat wave on the 17th and the 19th, um, but the rest of January stayed pretty cold with very little accumulated heat. So we're about 20 growing degree days for that second half of January. Um, when we look at February, um, which is over here, we um, must have had a big bump, bump in temperature that second week of the month 
because we do see that uh, that jump, especially we have from 22 to 29. Um, and then we uh, continue to have those warm days in uh, late February. And for those of you in the area, you probably remember the 75 degree weather we had on March 1st. And that's reflected here because on February 28th, we had growing degree day 69. And March 1st, at the end of that 24 hour period, we were up to 78. Um, on March 6th, we hit 72 degrees, so we had that another another bump in growing degree days from 81 to 90. So finally, if you if you're wondering how this year compares to other years, um, you can also view a summary for any given day using the phenology calendar. So uh, today in Columbus, Ohio, like we said, we're at 90 growing degree days uh, last year. <clears throat> 51, but in 2017, um, for instance, we were at 101. So we had a, a very warm start to the year in 2017. In 2015, we were only at five. Um, this year, we surpassed that on January 3rd. So um, you can really see there is quite a bit of variation, especially early in the year, but things tend to kind of even out as the year progresses. The, down here at the bottom, you can see that the 20 year average for the growing degree days on this date, March 10th, is 36. So you can look at the growing degree day accumulation in your area too, um, and look ahead to see what phenological events are approaching. Uh, like I said, this uh, tool can come in very handy, especially if you're uh, trying to predict pest uh, development. Um, and you can find this tool just by searching Ohio State Phenology Calendar. So as we embark on our, our spring wildflower hike, um, now you know why that bloom timing that we're going to see is, is a date range rather than a specific date or even a specific couple weeks. Um, and that's because these ephemerals depend on heat accumulation, just like that red maple. Um, I, I want to start by noting that this is by no means inclusive of everything you're going to find blooming in the woodlands in the springtime. Um, I simply chose a handful of species to highlight based on my own experiences and the photography that I have in my collection. Um, there are many other species out there that are just as deserving of attention. And at the end of the presentation, I'll provide a couple of resources um, if you'd like a more comprehensive list of uh, spring ephemeral wildflowers. Um, so many of what you're going to see today are true ephemerals, meaning that their emergence is brief, and once they're done flowering, their foliage uh, withers away until the following spring. Um, and there's others such as wild ginger and mayapple that uh, flowers in the early spring, but they're uh, vegetative, uh, the vegetative part of the plant sticks around into the summer. Um, and though they aren't wildflowers, I felt I would be remiss if I didn't also touch on some of the beautiful woody plants, um, such as spice bush, that we find blooming this time of year. So I've also um, gone ahead and thrown a couple of those in the mix as well. Um, the species are presented in the order in which they are found blooming in the springtime. So without further ado, let's hike. So as we go through each of these species, um, you're going to notice the common and scientific name along with the range of time that you will find this plant blooming in Ohio. So the plant itself um, may be out beyond that date range. Um, but the time that it's blooming is, is what's indicated there. This timing um, was taken from the Ohio Division of Natural Resources, um, Spring Wildflower Ohio, uh, Spring Wildflowers of Ohio Field Guide. <clears throat> so one of our earliest and smelliest native plants, um, skunk cabbage, begins appearing in late winter. Um, I've actually seen this as, as early as January. Uh, it looks remarkably alien-like, uh, and this unique plant can emerge when snow is still on the ground. Um, you might wonder, how can it manage some such cold temperatures? And it does this by producing its own heat. So this is uh, known as thermogenic, uh, and this adaptation allows the skunk cabbage to melt surrounding snow and ice to get uh, an extra early jump on flowering. Um, this heat 
also helps to spread its pungent odor into the air, attracting early pollinators, including scavenging flies. Um, eventually, large shiny green leaves will emerge um, and can grow up to two feet tall. Uh, skunk cabbage has a massive root system that can store large amounts of nutrients that are necessary for thermogenesis and uh, can produce lush foliage into the following year. <clears throat> you can look for this curious native uh, in wetlands, marshes, and other low-lying areas. Next up is Harbingerus spring, um, also known as salt and pepper plant. Um, Harbingerus spring is one of our earliest spring ephemerals. Um, it's found in rich hardwood forests of Eastern North America. Um, it's a member of the same family as the parsley and carrot, as you might guess from its foliage, which is pinnately divided into small sections and kind of lacy. Uh, it's only one to two inches in height, so this is a very easy one to miss on the forest floor um, amongst that leaf litter. <clears throat> it has these tiny white flowers with these striking purple anthers, um, and it is a true ephemeral, meaning that it withers away quickly after flowering. Now, as, most of the, as with most of the species you see today, they rely on insects for pollination. Um, in this case, uh, it relies on tiny native bees and flies. Next up is cut-leafed toothwort. Um, this is a, a fairly common spring ephemeral. Um, it can be abundant, and um, it's one of the few that can tolerate regenerating and disturbed sites. Uh, but it can also, of course, be found in rich woodlands. Uh, the common name for toothwort refers to tooth-like projections that are found on the underground stems of this plant. Now, you may notice that it has four petals, uh, which is a sign that it is in the mustard family. So the flower color itself can vary from pinkish to purplish to even white, and it is an important early nectar source for our native pollinators. The flowers appear bell-shaped uh, because, um, <clears throat> or the flowers are visited by several types of bees, um, and less commonly by early flying butterflies. Um, the foliage will eventually turn yellow and disappear. So this is a, a true ephemeral, though it does stick around a little bit longer in the spring than some of them. Um, but unfortunately, cut-leafed toothwort, as well as many of our spring wildflower species, um, have dis been displaced by another member of the mustard family, um, the non-native invasive garlic mustard, which we'll touch on that at the, again, at the end of the presentation. So also known as liverwort, uh, kidneywort, or pennywort, hepatica um, is uh, definitely a fan favorite. It's in the buttercup family. Uh, it grows from a rhizome, so the leaves and flowers actually emerge directly from the rhizome, not from a stem above ground. Uh, the leaves themselves are um, kind of the lobed, uh, the bottom of the leaves, and uh, depending on the plant can have a kind of a reddish color all the way to more of a green color. Um, over the winter, the leaves darken even more and can be hardly noticeable. Uh, the flowers are blue, purple, pink, or white, and uh, they produce pollen, but there is no nectar reward for those pollinators. Um, and the flowers attract uh, sweat bees and small carpenter bees. So spicefush, so this is one of the, those uh, uh, non-ephemerals that uh, I went ahead and threw in. Um, is a, a deciduous shrub that is found in rich forests, dry woodlands, on, dry forests on slopes and in swamps. And it's named for its leaves, which have a, a really nice odor when crushed. Now it is uh, in the spring an early flower. It has these beautiful yellow flowers and it is actually in Columbus, Ohio in full bloom right here, right now as we speak. Um, this plant is dioecious, which means that there are separate male and female plants. So in order for, uh, to produce fruit, which are these um, small red berries that you see in that bottom right picture, there must be a male and female plant present. 
Um, and um, if successfully pollinated, it produces this bright red droop that matures into the fall and is relished by wildlife. So next up is bloodroot. Um, bloodroot is in the poppy family. It uh, gets its name from a reddish sap that it exudes from all parts of the plant, but especially the root if it's cut. Um, it uh, has a flower on a stalk, um, a, a stalk that produces a solitary flower, and that flower stem is in enclosed by a single leaf that eventually unfurls. Uh, the flower opens in the sun and it closes at night or on very cloudy days um, when their pollinators aren't going to be active. And uh, the flowers themselves are ephemeral with the petals falling within a day or two of pollination. And if pollinated, uh, those flowers are followed by an elongated seed pod um, that you can kind of see in that bottom right picture. It's very small at that point, but it um, does continue to grow as those seeds develop. develop. Um, so this plant goes dormant and disappears by midsummer. <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's, it's one of those true ephemerals that you need to look out for. Rue anemone. Um, so rue anemone is in the buttercup family. It's small, it's lacy, it's delicate, it's beautiful. Um, because it's so low to the ground and it stays low to the ground, it can be easy to mix, miss. Um, but it is fairly common in a variety of woodland habitats, from flood plains to even drier uplands. Um, if you're lucky, you may even find a stand with pinkish flowers, but typically they are this brilliant white color. Um, and like some of our other spring ephemerals, they offer no nectar reward to visiting pollinators, but the species is still frequented by small bees and flies that will dine on, on its pollen. So purple cress, uh, we're gonna see this mid-March to mid-April. Uh, it is also in the mustard family with cutleaf toothwort. Um, it's actually in the same genus as cutleaf toothwort. It's fairly common, found in every county within the state of Ohio. It has these white to kind of uh, lavender colored petals. It reaches about a foot in height. And like its cutleaf cousin, purple cress prefers rich soils but it too can tolerate some of those disturbed habitats better than many of, of, of the uh, spring wildflowers we talk about today. Twin leaf, so this is my personal favorite. Um, it's relatively uncommon, so uh, because of that, I consider it a real treat to be able to see it. Uh, this is gonna be in bloom from late March to mid April. It's in the barberry family. And uh, its scientific name is named after Thomas Jefferson, who grew this plant in his gardens at Monticello. Both leaves and the flowers are produced at the same time uh, from a rhizome on long, smooth, purplish stems. And each leaf has two deeply divided symmetrical lobes. Uh, and you can kind of see that in the picture here. It, it almost looks like a set of butterfly wings. The flowers are short-lived. They only typically bloom for a single day. Um, and this, you know, you can tell that this photo was, was taken in the morning because this flower is getting ready to bloom. And the leaves will persist into the summertime. So white trout lily, um, as the, the name implies, this is uh, in the lily family. Uh, immature non-flowering plants have a single leaf, while flowering plants have two leaves on, of unequal size. Um, those leaves can be mottled with green and brown, and they can form these massive colonies like that, that photo that you see in the top right. Um, it can take up to eight years for these uh, to flower, so I find that most of the time I typically just find the leaves. Um, when I find the flowers, then I deem myself lucky. Um, there's also a species in the same genus that has a yellow flower um, called yellow trout lily, and you can see that uh, to the right. Um, and I've been lucky enough to find both of these species growing in the same area at the same time. So spring beauties. Um, this is a, a, you know, a common and frequent uh, spring ephemeral. <clears throat> it can be found in full sun in woodlands, pastures, 
um, even in untreated lawns. Um, it's typically white in color, but it's tinged with various uh, intensities of pinks. And interestingly, these colored stripes that you see on the petals uh, serve the same purpose as the lines of an airport runway, acting as guides for various for uh, visiting pollinators, leading them straight to the nectar reward um, and providing a pollination service for the plant, of course. Uh, many flowers have these um, guides. They're just uh, really prevalent uh, and easy to see here on these spring beauties. Um, they're an important nectar source for small native bees, and they actually have a specialist. So this is a, uh, a spring beauty specialist. It's a native mining bee. So next up is Dutchman's Breeches. Um, I think this wins the award for the most fun name. Um, you can kind of see where it got, gets its name based on what that flower looks like. Uh, it's in the same genus as Bleeding Heart, uh, which may be a plant that you have growing in your shade garden. Uh, it likes moist to well-drained soils. It can uh, occur in large populations. And bumblebees um, are their chief pollinators. If you're lucky enough, um, amongst the Dutchman breeches, you might also glimpse squirrel corn. So this, I think, wins the award for the weirdest name. <laughs> um, but you can kind of see it looks a little bit like a like a um, a piece of corn. And um, like I said, it's in the same genus as Dutchman's breeches. Uh, I don't find it to be quite as common, um, but it can be found growing side by side with Dutchman's breeches. And that difference, like I said, it can be found in the flower. Squirrel corn has more of a, a heart-shaped base uh, rather than the two defined spurs that the Dutchman breeches have. So golden ragwort, um, late March through May, so uh, a, kind of a, a longer blooming time than some of these other species that we're looking at. Uh, as you might guess, it's in the daisy family. It's also known as golden groundsel. Uh, it's found growing in forests, swamps, ravines, and riparian areas um, in Eastern North America. The plants consist of rounded, year-round uh, dark green foliage that you can see in that top right picture. The bottom of the leaves often have this brilliant purple color. Uh, the flat-topped flower clusters appear in spring um, and are 10 to 14 inches above the foliage. And many bees, flies, and beetles will use this plant as a nectar source. Um, and it is host to the northern meadowlark butterfly. Next up is Jack in the Pulpit. Uh, so this is, um, a, you know, fairly common to wooded habitats, but still a real treat to see. Uh, it can grow up to three feet tall. The jack in this case um, is that spike that you see in the, in the center, and that spike is covered with tiny flowers. Now this uh, plant produces what we consider, us humans consider, a bad odor. Um, it is pollinated by tiny flies, and this plant actually persists vegetatively into the summer and eventually, uh, those tiny flowers, if they're pollinated, will develop into uh, fruit. And you can see these, these clusters of, of red berries. Uh, green, green dragon is a similar species. It's in the same genus as Jack in the Pulpit. And it produces a very similar looking cluster of fruit um, in, uh, in the summer. Pawpaw. So here's another one, not a spring ephemeral. Uh, but definitely a really cool plant that you're going to find blooming this time of year if you're out looking for spring ephemerals. Um, it is our largest edible native fruit in North America. Um, obviously, most people know pawpaw for its fruit, but it also has these fantastic, beautiful little flowers. Uh, it's a great understory tree. Um, a single individual can form dense colonies, so kind of like an aspen. Um, it's able to send up shoots from its roots and really fill a space. Uh, the pawpaw tree blooms in the early spring from April to May before the tree leaves out. Beetles and flies are thought to be um, primary pollinators of pawpaw blooms. 
And the flowers are self-incompatible, which means that um, flowers must be cross-pollinated. Cross and in order for fruit to form, that pollen has to be from an unrelated, uh, genetically different pawpaw um, from, that, from that parent plant. So um, these large uh, groves of pawpaws can be deceiving because it looks like a lot of different individuals, whereas it can, they can all be genetically uh, uh, similar, or genetically alike, because um, it's all from the same parent plant. So, uh, you know, if you have pawpaws and you're lacking fruit set, that could be one thing that you're missing is, a, is a, another individual to be able to do that cross-pollination. So Virginia bluebells, um, this is a fan favorite. It can also often be found, uh, you know, for sale for gardens at garden stores. Um, it's easily naturalized into uh, it's easily easily naturalized into moist, uh, shady woodland gardens. Um, it can form large colonies, which is the the background of my photo today. Um, often you find these in floodplains and moist woodlands. They have these beautiful bell-shaped flowers that are about an inch long. They have a pleasant light scent, um, and there are some variants with pink or white flowers. And they are pollinated uh, by bumblebees and other long-tongued bees, um, but are visited uh, at, by butterflies, skippers, um, humming, hummingbird moths, uh, and even hummingbirds. So this, is, this plant is a true ephemeral. Uh, the plant will quickly wither away after bloom. So wood poppy, so as its name indicates, this. Uh, perennial is in the poppy family. Um, it's native to moist woodlands of eastern North America. Uh, that bright yellow to yellow orange flower, um, they're produced in large numbers in the early spring and they are pollinated um, by bees. Now this plant uh, will go dormant if the soil becomes very dry, but the foliage will persist uh, into the summer as long as uh, it has necessary amount of moisture. Uh, this is a showy, relatively long-lived wildflower um, that adapts easily to flower gardens, so it often is grown as an ornamental in beds um, as well as in uh, naturalistic plantings. So Jacob's Ladder, um, it's in the Phlox family. Um, it is found in rich, shaded, moist woodlands. So those leaves are pinnately compound, um, resembling a ladder. And uh, the name is referring to a ladder seen in a dream by the biblical Jacob, thus the name Jacob's Ladder. Uh, its flowering stems are low to the ground, uh, but also tend to droop to the side, giving this plant kind of a sprawling look. Uh, the bell-shaped flowers are a shade of blue that really pops on the forest floor. And though those blooms are ephemeral, um, it will persist vegetatively into the summer. And it is pollinated by bees and butterflies. So early April to mid-May, you might come across blue cohosh. Uh, it has a, a lacy blue-green foliage and these cute small flowers that mature into beautiful blueberries. Um, it's fairly common in rich, well-shaded woodlands. Uh, the plant is found in hardwood forests and favors moist coves and hillsides, uh, generally in shady locations and rich soil. Um, the plant is pollinated in, uh, by early bee species. Uh, which are attracted by nectar glands that are present on the petals of the flower. Um, you may be familiar with black cohosh, um, and although they are similarly named, uh, they are actually uh, in uh, separate uh, genera, so they are not closely related, even though they, they do have that, that similar common name. Um, that's why one reason common names can be quite tricky. All right, so great white trillium. Um, of course, this is our state wildflower. Uh, there are over 40 native trillium in the state of Ohio. Um, you know, they're common in woodlands with diverse wildflower displays. 
Those flowers will actually turn pink as they age. So there are species of trillium that are pink, but um, many times um, if you're seeing a, a pink trillium, um, it could just be an aged great white trillium. Um, white trillium can occur in large stands. Um, it is a, a slow growing plant and the flowering age is actually determined largely by the surface of the leaf and the size of the rhizome instead of the age of uh, the age uh, alone. And because growth is very slow, um, it typically requires seven to 10 years in optimal conditions in order to reach flowering size. So if you see a flowering white trillium, you know it's been there for a while. Um, so trillium as well as other uh, species of trillium are a favorite food of white-tailed deer. Um, and if trillium are present, uh, deer will, will seek these out um, to the exclusion of other plants. Um, and in the course of normal browsing, deer uh, can consume large amounts of individuals. And a lot of times they'll pick the tallest ones and they'll leave the shortest ones behind. Um, and they've actually been shown interestingly to disperse seeds on rare occasions. Uh, typically the seeds are dispersed by ants. So toad shade, this is also a trillium. Uh, this is a species that occurs in a range of habitats and rich deciduous woodlands, floodplains, and riverbanks. Um, it is uh, stalkless. And that flower is directly above the three world leaves and appears closed at all times. Um, but it's just because those petals that make it up are so narrow. Um, there can be much variation in the modeling that you see on the leaves. Some can be quite modeled. Um, others can lack the modeling completely. Um, and those flowers attract its primary pollinators, which are flies and beetles. Marsh marigold um, is in the buttercup family. Um, it's found in marshes, fens, ditches, wet woods, and swamps. Um, it has these glossy green basil leaves that are round, um, oval, and uh, the flowers are showy, shiny, yellow, and occur in clusters. Those flowers um, often po offer pollen and nectar to insect visitors and are commonly pollinated by hoverflies. So common blue violet. Um, there are more than 30 species of violets that call Ohio home, and this is the most common of all violet species. Um, so along with natural areas, these are fairly common, um, even in mowed yards and other unnatural habitats. Those flowers can range in color from shades of um, blue and violet all the way to white. And they spread primarily through underground rhizomes and can form vegetative colonies. Um, they also spread by seed, uh, which is distributed by ants. Squaw root. Um, so perhaps you have noticed this on the forest floor and uh, mistaken it for a fungus, but squall root, believe it or not, is a flowering plant. Um, it is a parasitic plant that derives its nutrients solely from the roots of oak trees. Uh, it connects to the roots of oak trees with specialized roots, and as such, um, it only grows in the presence of oaks, um, and uh, you can probably tell by that pale color, it does none of its own photosynthesis. Um, it's cone-shaped flower it has, is this pale cream color in the late spring, and eventually it'll dry up and later it'll turn brown. And that brown shriveled up, um, <clears throat> those brown sh shriveled up cone-like protrusions can persist all winter, um, and it can be eaten by deer and bear that serve as uh, dispersers for its seed. Uh, there's another parasitic plant that you might find in the woods called beech drops. Um, it subsists on the roots of beech trees, and it is in the same family, the broom rape family, um, as the American squall root. So 
So next up is wild blue phlox. So we can find that flowering from early April to late May. Um, one of its common names is wild sweet william. It is fairly common in woodlands, even young regenerating woodlands. And as its common name suggests, woodland phlox um, does best in woodland conditions that are in partial shade, um, rich, moist, well-drained soils. Um, but it is adaptable and it will tolerate dry and clay soils um, and is even drought, drought tolerant once established. Um, as a result, it's increasingly offered as an ornamental um, to use in cultivated gardens, and there are even several cultivars that are available. Those flowers um, can, the, can range from shades of purple, from, you know, from pale lavender to violet blue, and occasionally even kind of a, a pastel pink or white. Um, it is loved by butterflies, especially swallowtails. Um, as well as moths and bees. And I did want to note that Dame's rocket is an invasive species that we find along roadways throughout the summer. It can easily be mistaken for flocks. Now, Dame's rocket has four petals. Um, it is in the mustard family, like garlic mustard, um, while our wild blue phlox has five petals um, and is one of our good natives. So next up is fire pink. This is one I do not see very often, but when I do see it, it's something you can spot from far away because of that beautiful um, bright color. Um, it's you know scattered statewide. It usually occurs in just these small clumps rather than large populations. Um, it's one of our most cons conspicuous plants because of that brilliant scarlet color. And as you might have guessed by that color, hummingbirds are an, an important pollinator for fire pink. Golden seal. So this is a plant that you might find blooming from mid-April to early May. Um, it is in the buttercup family. It um, grows in mesic forests under deciduous trees. Um, it becomes six to 20 inches tall and usually has these kind of these maple-like shiny green leaves. Uh, the stem is terminated by a single white flower um, that is followed by a tight cluster of red fruit that uh, resembles a raspberry. You can see in that bottom right picture there. Um, the plant grows in rich, uh, moist forest in its range. Um, however, it is over collected by the herbal industry, um, and that has really had a, a, a negative impact on many of its native populations. Um, golden seal has a long history as a medicinal herb and remains popular even today. Violetwood sorrel. So this is a, um, a delicate plant, um, up to 16 inches tall. It has these long stemmed leaves that grow from the base and um, are at first longer than the flowering stems and those, flower, those, those flowering stems shoot up as it flowers. You're probably familiar with uh, sorrel with yellow flowers. Um, it's probably a weed <laughs> growing in your garden that you deal with. Um, it's also known as sour grass because of the taste of its foliage. Um, but violet wood sorrel, it's, uh, you know, it may be small, but it's quite showy. It can form um, decent sized colonies. And like those of all wood sorrels, the leaves fold downward at night and when uh, the weather is cloudy. So bellwort, so this is in the lily family um, and it is naturally pretty droopy. So uh, kind of this, this withered look is, uh, is natural for it. I have a basset hound at home and this definitely a resemblance with bellwort. <laughs> um, it's pollinated by uh, small bees and seeds and the seeds are disturbed by ant, distributed by ants. Um, the plants remain throughout the summer. So it is a, an ephemeral, as far as it's blooming, it's usually done blooming by late May, but uh, that vegetative part will stick around into the summer. Uh, once they finish flowering, the leaves and stems become more erect and have the appearance of uh, Solomon seal or false Solomon seal, which we'll talk about in a little bit here. 
So Wild Ginger, this is another one of my uh, all time favorites. Uh, this is a, a low growing ground cover. It has these beautiful heart shaped leaves that have these fine hairs on them that really glisten in the sun. The flowers are uh, brown or maroon. Um, they're pendulous and they hang at ground level under the foliage amongst the leaf litter. Um, and they're said to be pollinated by ants um, and other small insects that crawl into the flowers, including ground beetles. Um, the creeping rhizomes have a ginger-like odor and flavor. Um, the Native Americans would actually use the root to flavor foods like we use culinary ginger, um, which uh, should, I should note is a completely different plant family. So this is not related to the ginger that you um, might buy at the store. Um, but wild ginger makes an excellent ground cover for shady sites. Um, and under favorable conditions, it can spread quickly and vigorously. Um, it's not a true ephemeral in the sense that those leaves are going to stick around all growing season, um, even into the late fall. Definitely a really cool plant. Pink Lady Slipper. So um, this is, uh, if you see this, you should count yourself lucky. Um, it's, a, it's a gorgeous plant flowering in late April to mid-May, and it is an orchid. An orchid. Um, it is a, a showy wildflower. Another common name for this plant is moccasin flower. It has these two basal leaves that you can see in that uh, top right picture there, um, and a large flower at the end of an erect stalk. And in order to survive um, and reproduce, pink, pink lady slipper, um, as well as other orchids, actually has a, an interesting symbiotic relationship with the fungus in the soil. So threads of the fungus will actually break open the seeds, um, attach to them, and pass along food and nutrients. And once the or orchid is older and photosynthesizing, the fungus will extract nutrients from its roots. So it's, it's a mutually beneficial relationship um, between the fungus and the orchid, um, and that's typical of almost all orchid species. Uh, it's pollinated by bees who are lured into its pouch by its sweet scent. Um, but once those bees make, them make their way into the pouch, the only way out is for them to pass by the masses of pollen. Um, so uh, they uh, effectively pollinate the plant at that point. Um, ladies, pink lady slippers uh, live in a variety of habitats, growing in mixed hardwood coniferous forests of pine and hemlock. Um, they love acidic soils, but well-drained soils, and um, there's also a closely related species with white flowers, and I included a photo of that as well. White baneberry. Um, so white baneberry is in the buttercup family. Um, there are two baneberry species commonly found um, in understory wooded areas in the Midwest. Uh, red baneberry is widely distributed throughout uh, most of North America, um, except in the southeastern U.S., while white baneberry, which is what you see here, um, is found primarily in the eastern and midwest part of the country. Both species are going to be found in moist, nutrient-rich sites um, in a variety of ecosystems. And if pollinated, these waxy berries will form. Um, these berries start out green, but they ripen um, by midsummer, by mid to late summer, and then they will persist on the plant until fall. So red baneberry generally has red berries, while those of white baneberry um, are generally white with a prominent black dot, like the one that you see here. Um, and this fruit uh, actually gives this plant another one of its nicknames, which is doll's eye. Uh, the entire plant is toxic but the roots and berries are the most poisonous. Uh, this poison does not affect birds, however, so they are able to eat the berries and they are the main, seed, or the main dispersers of the seed. Fall Solomon seal is up next. Um, this is in the lily family. This plant uh, ranges across most of North America, north of Mexico. Um, it prefers moist, rich, well-drained soils and partial uh, to full shade, but it'll also tolerate drier and rockier conditions. 
Uh, it gets its name from its superficial resemblance to Solomon seal, which I just realized this moment I did not include in my slideshow, um, and I probably should have. But Solomon seal um, vegetatively looks very similar to false Solomon seal. Uh, the difference is uh, the location of the flower. So false Solomon seal has this plume of flowers found um, at the, the tip of the plant, whereas Solomon seal has flowers that, uh, that are um, kind of uh, look like little bells and are found along the stem, the entire stem of the plant on the un uh, underside of the plant. Um, so false Solomon seal uh, flowers are followed by these uh, fruit that begin green and will ripen into red. Um, and oftentimes they are speckled and kind of have this russet color to them. Uh, birds and mice may eat the berries and disperse the seeds into new areas. So may apples. Uh, so these are fairly common um, and uh, fairly commonly recognized for their leaf. Uh, and it, it gr typically grows in large colonies from a single root and open deciduous forest and shady fields. Um, and it, they will even persist at a site that had, has been logged and was once wooded um, for quite a while. And although the flowers are quite showy, they are short-lived, uh, they are usually hidden by the leaves and visited by bumblebees and other long-tongued bees. Now, if pollinated, the flowers will develop into small fleshy fruits known as mayapples, and they are eaten by box turtles and other wildlife that disperse their seeds. So in terms of pollination, um, like I had kind of have been mentioning throughout this entire presentation, um, most of these species rely on insects to physically transport the pollen um, opposed to wind. And really, if you think about it, that makes sense. Um, because these species are, are really low to the ground. Now, because of this, it makes them a very important nectar source and pollen source for our early native bees, wasps, flies, and beetles. Um, and some of our native pollinators even specialize in these eph ephemerals, such as this spring beauty specialist, this um, spring beauty minor bee. When it comes to seed dispersal, um, while some species will utilize wind and water to carry their seeds away from the parent plant, um, many species will utilize animals. <clears throat> now, um, there are a number of ways that plants have uh, evolved to um, get an animals to disperse their seeds. Um, colorful berries is one of them. So you'll notice that you know most berries that you see out there may start out as green, but eventually they ripen to a color. And they do that as a visual cue, as a signal to wildlife that my seed is mature, I'm ready for it to, you know, to, to uh, leave the nest, so to speak. Um, and that is a, a signal for, to wildlife to uh, go ahead and, and consume the seed and hopefully deposit it um, away from its parent plant. Um, that's the same case with freshy, fleshy fruit and nutrient-rich nuts. Um, when we talk about some of our, uh, especially, I know this is spring ephemerals, but when we talk about our, um, uh, some of our uh, oak trees, some of our hard mass trees, um, you know, that there's a lot of uh, nutrients, a lot of energy that is put into producing uh, those nuts. And of course, many of those nuts are consumed by wildlife, but many of them are cached by things like squirrels and uh, blue jays uh, and chipmunks um, that you know intend to come back and eat them but never do so um, it's kind of another trick that that plants are able to have up their sleeve able to use in order to uh, distribute their seed um, and then also burrs on fur so this uh, will uh, effectively allow the seed to hitch a ride on an unsuspecting host um, such as animal fur or even on the pants leg of someone like you and me. Um, but wait, what may be the, the most interesting form of seed dispersal um, is provided by ants. 
So many of our spring ephemerals, including bloodroot, Dutchman's breeches, hepatica, trout lily, violets, wild ginger, um, the list goes on, um, uses a, uh, a, a, a trick that is able to not only get their seed dispersed, but also get it planted. So the plant itself will create this uh, fleshy appendage called an elasome. Now, though the plant uses energy to produce this structure, it doesn't provide those nutrients to the developing seed. So this is, um, this is not created, this is not um, um, created by the plant as plant, as, as food for the plant or food for the seed. Rather, um, it is uh, created as food for ants. So these structures are really rich in lipids and proteins. And it turns out that they are equivalent of it to a big juicy steak for an ant. Now these ants will transport the entire seed, elasome and all, underground, um, often far from the mother plant, um, and then they will proceed to eat the elasome. They are uninterested in the seed, so they will take that to their waste disposal area, um, which is happens to be rich in nutrients because of ant frats and dead ant bodies. Um, these are conditions perfect for seed germination um, and uh, essentially is planting the seed. So the ant gets a good meal. The plant benefits because its seeds are dispersed to favorable germination sites. Um, so it's really kind of the best of both worlds. So, you know, nature never fails to amaze. Now, since spring ephemerals occupy such a narrow window, um, they're susceptible to environmental changes and disturbances. Because remember, it's this time of year when they're, when they're out, when they're blooming, it's a really hard time to be a plant. Um, that's why everything else is dormant still. So many factors can have a negative impact on these spring beauties, including habitat destruction, development, deer overpopulation, invasive plants, and the uncertainty of a change in climate. So what can we do? Well, we can start by removing the invaders. So when we talk about invasive species, um, you know, on their home turf, plants and animals are kept in check by natural controls, um, like predators and food supply. However, when species are um, introduced, whether accidentally or intentionally, into a new landscape um, that's not used to their presence, the consequences can be devastating. So some of the common culprits um, in woodland areas include bush honeysuckle, privet, garlic mustard, multiflora rose, Japanese honeysuckle, autumn olive, and Japanese um, still grass. So these are all um, invasive plants that are common in woodland areas and can um, quickly displace many of those beautiful species that we looked at today. Now, if you're interested in learning more about identifying these understory invaders, uh, I encourage you to visit the Ohio Woodland Stewards website. Um, where you will find uh, an assortment of fact sheets with information on identification and um, management of many invaders that are prevalent in Ohio woodlands. Um, there are also videos on the website on how to um, treat some of these, whether you're using some type of manual removal or an, uh, an herbicide, some type of chemical removal. Um, and also, uh, I recently did a presentation for Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge on an invasive plant um, identification. So I can drop that link in, a, in the chat after, um, after the presentation for those of you that might be interested in viewing that. So in terms of other resources um, for wildflowers, um, I encourage you to check out your state's uh, Division of Natural Resources website. Um, if you're in Ohio, ODNR puts out a really great Ohio Spring Wildflower Guide, um, and that is available for download as a PDF on their website. And um, DNAP, the Ohio Division of Natural Areas and Preserves, 
has an Ohio native spring wildflower checklist that is arranged by flower color. So um, if you're out and about exploring natural areas, um, you might as well turn it into a scavenger hunt. So this gives you an idea of um, what you might find out there. And with that, um, I am happy to answer any questions. Um, like I said earlier, I am not a botanist, um, but if I can't answer the question, perhaps um, one of my colleagues can, or I can point you in the direction of someone who can. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Awesome, thank you so much, Carrie. That was fascinating. It was another one of those webinars where I looked at the time, I'm like, oh, it's 11 o'clock already. I was just lost in everything that you were saying. So excellent job. Lots of great comments and thank yous from people. So make sure if you have time, scroll through the chat. But I will read the questions for you. Feel free to follow along. Um, and so let's start off with, uh, there's a question when you were doing the growing degree date, somebody was asking where to get the species calendar list. The Yeah, so the, the species calendar list can be found um, on the on the Growing Degree Day website. So on that, uh, if you um, Google Ohio State Phenology Calendar, um, you put in your zip code and date. Um, the first thing that comes up are the blocks with the different pictures, but right above those blocks, there's a button that says View Full Calendar. Okay. And that's where you're gonna get that full list of, of uh, um, the different um, species and their plant development. Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe you can put that uh, website in the in the chat. Absolutely. Uh, Elaine is asking, is wood poppy an Ohio native? I believe, as far as I know, yes, I believe it is. Yep. Oops. Okay. And then, um, let's see. Jeannie is asking, um, she, uh, he, he, sorry, saw a cabbage butterfly about a week ago. Um, is this a miscalculation on nature's part? <laughs> that is a great question. Um, yeah, that could definitely, definitely be the case. You know, with, um, with these warm days that we have, it can, uh, definitely throw things off. It can, um, you know, even though things occur in the same order every year, we do kind of, I mean, there's always that, uh, that opportunity for, for, for one-offs, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think as far as um, predictions go, uh, it, it does get trickier and trickier when we have these 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 strange climatic events. Yeah, yeah, I think cabbage white is also one that if they pupate later in the year, they may overwinter and then emerge earlier. So that's a possibility too. And just like you said, if we have these warm days, then they're going to say, "Oh, it's time to wake up." Yeah, and I know, you know, as far as where I am, I'm in Lancaster, Ohio, other than that cold snap that we had in December, which was a true cold snap, um, it's it's been extremely mild. So, um, you know, there are things that I see in my backyard woodland, um, for instance, Japanese honeysuckle. Um, some years it, it loses its leaves. This year it, it was an evergreen. It, it looks like it's rearing and ready to go this year already. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will say the vet yesterday said to me he's had ticks already in the last 10 days to two weeks oh, yeah. oh, so because yeah. he said to me have you put flea, flea and tick treatment on your cat yet I'm like mm, no <laughs> he's like you need to do it so yeah that's that's good advice for sure yeah very prevalent yeah yeah uh Jack is asking are cohosh berries edible um I I've always learned that blue cohosh berries are toxic um, to humans. Um, but that would be something that I would have to fact check. Kathy, do you happen to know? I believe you're right. I don't have my, um, noxious poisonous book here, um, at home, but I'm pretty certain you're right on that one. Yeah. I see somebody put in the chat. Everything is edible. edible ones. Ones. <laughs> <laughs> very true, Bill. Very true. That's very true. Um, so lots of great comments, Carrie, on your, your pre presentation style, on the pictures that you shared. And we've had a couple of quest requests. Um, maybe you could share with me a PDF of your slides 
and I could post. So a few people have been saying, oh, these are great for, you know, IDing out in the field and stuff like that. So I didn't want to forget to ask you about that. Um, okay, so then Sandy is asking, so another wood poppy question, can you okay. explain the difference between lesser celadine and wood poppy? And then later on, I think there's a question about the difference between later celadine and marsh marigold. Yes, absolutely. So kind of highlighting some differences there. Yeah, so lesser celandine, um, as far as as looks go, um, it has more more distinct petals, more, has a greater quantity of petals. Um, they're more uh, slender, a little bit more distinct than um, the poppy. Poppies, I, I think, typically have four petals, um, maybe maybe five. Let me. I always kind of when I picture them in my mind, picture you know no more than four petals. Um, the foliage itself looks very different uh, with, with the, the um, wood poppy. That foliage is going to be uh, divided. Um, it kind of uh, resembles um, maybe like a highly divided maple leaf almost, um, whereas lesser celandine is uh, they're going to be entire leaves, um, maybe kind of a wavy margin and, and glossy. So um, the plant itself uh, look look quite different, even though those yeah those flowers are are yellow as both species. And of course, lesser celandine is an invasive species um, that I probably should have put on that list as far as one of the biggies for woodlands, especially if you have a a, a moist woodland. Um, these are oftentimes you can find just blankets of these that that take over those 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 moist woodlands. And back to your blue cohosh, yes, the berries are poisonous. Okay. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. Um, we have a question about the East Palestine impact. So how, how are, um, you know, the wildflowers and wildlife being monitored for impacts? I don't know if you can speak to that as well. I can speak a little bit on the wildlife side if, um, if you'd like me to. And, I haven't come across anything as far as plant life. I don't know if you have. Yeah, I I have not heard anything. Um, that would be a, a good question for. I don't know if there's any um, state nature preserves in that area. I would if if so, I would think that would be something that um, Division of Natural Areas and Preserves um, would be would be monitoring. But other than that, I'll I'll let you talk a little bit about wildlife, Marnie. Yeah, will, Marnie, I'll Go add for. Division of Forestry is going to fly the area and monitor um, the trees that Tom Macy and I were talking the other day because nice. we had a question from a maple producer about should they still tap kind of thing. And um, Tom said that they're rolling it into their forest health monitoring program and they will be doing some extra monitoring um, in the area on the tree species. Yeah. Right. Um, so on February 23rd, uh, the ODNR director, Mary Mertz, released, well, she had an interview, and then there was a news uh, release um, on the website and shared. And I did just put the link to that in the chat box. So if you want to check that out, that has a lot of good information about what they found in terms of the wildlife side of things. So just in summation, they reported an estimated number of animals killed. It was around 43 1,700 um, and about 78 or sorry, 38,000 of those were minnows. The rest were small aquatic life, crayfish, other small fish, macro invertebrates, and some amphibians. And they reported that a lot of the results were from acute exposure. So something that happened immediately after the event. Um, that said, they're still continuing to impact um, or monitor impacts on wildlife, including non-aquatic wildlife and as of now, they haven't reported any impacts um, to non-aquatic wildlife. So the other thing I'll just end with, which I find interesting is they report there's lots of unknowns because wildlife were never expected to, to encounter these types of chemicals in this way. So there's not a lot of research on what those impacts might be. And I'm sure that uh, applies to the rest of organis the organisms out there as well. Um, and so, Again, they're going to continue to monitor, uh, especially as there could be some cascading impacts. I mean, when you think about uh, such a large number of aquatic life just gone, 
you know, what kind of impacts is that going to have further up into the food web? So um, I encourage you to check out that link. There's some interesting photos and some ad additional information um, there as well. All right, next question. Uh, there's a question on, is it legal to forage in the metro parks? I do not know the answer to that. At least in Columbus and Franklin County, no. And I would guess that that is probably the case in a lot of the other um, metro parks as well. You're usually not allowed to take anything um, from our metro parks. That's pretty standard. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Deborah's asking, are pansies a cultivated form of the wild violet? Are these plants related? I do believe so. Let me, what is the scientific name? And while you're looking that up, Elena uh, reported the same is true for Columbus City Parks, no collecting. So thank you, Elena, for that. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so the garden pansy um, cultivated as a garden flower. Yeah, so it is um, derived by hybridization from several species um, in the um, same genus as the wild violets that we that we found out in the woods. So, and you know that makes sense when you think about when when the pansies are out, they don't really like the heat of the summer, um, but you're going to find them in the, the early spring, in the um, in the late fall as well. So. I think it's always kind of fun when you when we make those connections between what we you know see out in the woods and then what we see in the garden centers. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, question about how is white baneberry pollinated? White baneberry. That was a new one for me. I hadn't learned much about that one. Hmm. I'm gonna have to look for it when I'm out in the woods next time. I see it frequently. Do you, yeah, I'm sure I have. I just didn't know what it was. Yeah. I know that it is insect pollinated um, as what, as far as what specific insects, you know, I would say some of our, our native early insects. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Indiana Native Plant Society um, is suggesting sweat bees as being a primary pollinator um, cool. for a white baneberry. Nice. All right. Uh, Jack is asking, do growing degree or does the growing degree day chart predict mushroom appearance? <laughs> yeah, that, that's not nice. a chart. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of things that aren't on the chart, but Kathy, do you, how closely tied is, is our, our mushrooms to growing degree days? I, so there are just other factors for mushrooms. It's yeah. soil moisture um, and the heat. And so we used to always, I mean, where I am in, in Morrow County, we always used to talk that you'd have morels around that last week of April, first week of May. It stays consistent, but I will say that some years that are really dry springs, we have very few morels. And so I think it's just really linked to both. So you have to have both the combos um, in order for them to thrive. Um, so I, it, I don't think you could, I think it'd be really tough because right now we're here at 55 growing degree days. We have not reached full bloom of red maple, but um, we're not, our trees for syrup, for sap are not running anymore. So even trying to tie growing degree days to that, there's other factors, moisture in the soil, and those warm days just really um, can kill some things. And so those cycles get knocked off course when that happens. So it probably can factor, but I don't think it'd be very predictive. That's the challenge though, of going out and finding mushrooms, right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Nothing on the first view before you- Not easy. Act. Yeah, it's the whole challenge <laughs> of it. All right, Jean uh, is asking, is there a good guide that lists wildflowers by time like your presentation does? Um, there, you know, they found ones by color, but 
you know, just wondering if there, if you can recommend a good guide. And I know we can't always predict that, but you know, we're all yeah. as far as listed in order, I know I have seen something um, that that lists them in order in terms of phonology. I know that what um, you know what I had mentioned that I actually have a in front of me here the ODNR or, or the DNAP uh, Native Spring Wildflower Checklist is um, is uh, organized by by color. I know on the division uh, on the, um, the ODNR Spring Wildflower website they have. And I know, especially over COVID, they did a really nice job of keeping it updated as far as what is blooming now. So that could be a nice resource. Um, actually, I'll go ahead and put the link in the chat right now. But um, it has a, a section with now blooming in Ohio. It has the harbinger of spring and hepatica uh, um, on there. And they do a pretty nice job of, of keeping that updated throughout the year. They release these bloom reports. So if you scroll down on that page, you can see the 2023 wildflower bloom report that was released on March 2nd. Uh, so you can kind of have an idea of what is blooming each week. So that could be a good resource. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Kim's asking, where do I find the fact sheets? I don't recall which ones you were referring to. Yeah. So the fact sheets, and actually, I'll just. I was going to say they're on the Woodland Stewards website nice. under publications. Yeah, so if you go to Ohio Woodland Stewards publications and then those specific ones um, on the invasive species um, were under forestry, I believe. Yes. 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 Oh, okay, the scroll down. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And there's the Ailanthus, bush honeysuckle, privet, autumn olive, garlic mustard, um, stilt grass. Uh, definitely great fact sheets they're they're very comprehensive um ohio invasive plant council is uh, another good place to look mm -hmm. uh that is going to have i just put the link in the chat box. oh thank you yep that's going to have <laughs> recommendations for um for uh controlling invasive species also excellent uh, somebody's asking about propagation. Can you talk about that? Uh, can you help populate these species by helping the process along? Yeah, so um, propagation of, of many of these species uh, can, can be quite tricky. Um, and I can, uh, I have firsthand experience with that. That's something that, I, that I've tried to do. Um, a lot of trial and error, error um, a lot of fail, failure, quite honestly. Um, but some of these, a lot of these species, I know like trillium, for instance, has a double dormancy. <clears throat> so it is not going to um, germinate the, the first year um, after it, that seed is distributed. It has to sit there for a couple of years. Um, and, you know, it can take seven years for it to flower. So many of these species are long lived. Uh, and because of that, they can be tricky to propagate by seed. Um, but, uh, you know, some of them, I think, are becoming more prevalent and, and far, as far as um, garden centers go. And then there are some specialty growers out there uh, that, uh, you know, specialize in, in native plants and have a pretty nice selection of spring ephemerals. Um, so that's also a good option is to let somebody do the growing for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. I know that uh, some of the soil and water tree sales uh, last year, I think it was last year, the Hawking County Soil and Water Tree Sale actually sold uh, um wild ginger um rhizomes so uh cool. was able to to plug some of those in in my woods and i've been really happy with with that awesome um kathy is asking if you have suggestions for removal of invasive honeysuckle in the home landscape I know yeah, you're about that. One, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um you know if we're talking about bush honeysuckle um depending on, on how big it is. It is a, a fairly shallow rooted shrub when, in terms of shrubs. So if you wanna grub it out, that, that's an option if it's small enough. Um, if it's too large to, to grub out or you don't wanna disturb, um, cause in some cases that could cause more disturbance than it's worth. Then um, if we're just talking about a few plants, uh, my recommendation would be to cut it down and use a, um, a cut stump treatment. Um, so use uh, if you're going to do like a water soluble like uh, 
um, glyphosate, then you're going to be using a kind of a, a higher higher uh, higher strength of that, I guess. Whereas with a garlon four, um, that's more oil based. Uh, um, that's another option as well. That fact sheet's going to give you more of that information as far as uh, concentration goes, and of course, label is law, so always follow the label. Um, but if you are just going to cut it down, I would encourage you to follow that up with an herbicide because it will come back. I'm sorry, just looking at the chat. Uh, chat. What was the um, the sale with the wild ginger that you just mentioned? It was SWCD, but what county? Um, this was Hawking County. Now this was last year's tree sale. I have not seen their list this year, and I'm not sure if their their if their tree sale is still um, going on or or not. I know that I know in the past Franklin County Soil and Water has had a nice uh, selection in their tree sale of um, herbaceous species. So that might be another another avenue. Thanks. Uh, okay, Lois is asking, I was told that erythronium, which is, I think that's the trout lily, tend to move deeper and deeper into the soil over time. Um, do the roots pull them down uh, unless you plant over something impermeable? Is that true or false? She or he, sorry, uh, had trouble growing them in my little woodland area. Hmm. I, I honestly am not sure. Um, I know that I've, you know, seen really large concentrations of them in the wild. This is not, that's not something I've ever tried to grow in my own woods. Um, so I don't know, that would some, be something that I'd need to investigate a little bit more. Um, and, and then another little question. Um, they heard that may apple fruit stay bitter and unpalatable until they are ready to be dispersed. Is that true? Well, I've never eaten one, but <laughs> Just based on you know what we know about plants, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, you know, until that that uh, you know that seed is is fully formed and fully developed, the plant doesn't want it to be uh, you know distributed ahead of time. So it would make sense that it's only going to be palatable once that seed is ready to ready to leave the nest. Okay, I oh, answered that one. So Barbara is asking, <clears throat> when we see these tender ephemerals, should we leave them covered with leaves to protect them from upcoming freezing temps or uncover them so they can be pollinated better? Um, you know, I, I think your best bet I, is just to, to leave them how they are. Um, I think that that leaf litter definitely could help as a, a little bit of a blanket, a little bit of an insulation when we have those cold, cold those cold snaps, um, those cold nights. The pollinators will find them. Um, you know, nature nature finds a way. Uh, so that would be something I just recommend just just to kind of leave it. You know, enjoy it, look at it, take a picture of it, um, and then just leave it how you found it. Yeah. A um, couple messages in the chat just to draw folks' attention to that. There were a couple books mentioned. One is Wildflowers of Ohio, which I have. I would also recommend that one. And then Debbie said that she lives near Bowling Green and, Green and she has wild ginger. So if you'd like any, private message her on Facebook. Um, and Clara just put up another link uh, for the Midwest Native Plant Conference. That's a great com uh, conference and they always have a wonderful plant sale during that. And looks like the dates are July 28th and 30th this year. Uh, Alan Lee is suggesting that we do a webinar on burrs on fur. I love that phrase too. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> that was fantastic. Yeah. So yeah, if anybody has a suggestion as to somebody who could talk about burrs on fur, <laughs> um, that would be fun. So thanks for that suggestion, Alan. Uh, Jeannie's asking, can you post a link for the info on invasives? We did that already. Great. Um, and then Mary Lou is asking about ramps. Can you tell us anything about ramps? Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> You know, ramps are, are one of our, I, I didn't include them today because they don't flower until summer. <laughs> and at that point, uh, they, they kind of have a, you know, a little bit of opposite of what we saw mostly today, because most of those are, are uh, you know, going to flower and have, and have that vegetative part, whereas the ramps are, are opposite. So we're going to see the vegetative part this time of year. Um, I know I have a little patch of ramps out in my woodland, and I've been watching them closely. They're you know they're there, um, but they're they're still pretty small. Um, and then later in the year they'll they'll, uh, 
they'll send up a flower after their their vegetation is is gone at that point um but yeah so they're in the 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 onion family they're a really cool plant that i think you're only going to find in woodlands that are undisturbed uh this is not something that i you know just find all over the place uh like some of uh ginseng um and some of those those others that have medicinal value uh there's an issue with over harvest so um that's something to to kind of keep in mind but yeah i i don't know if, if there's any specific questions about ramps no just what about them yeah. <laughs> if if you want more I love them pop yeah. another question in the q a and we can yeah love them. into more detail awesome um i have i will tell you that that is one that i have tried to propagate in the past um but fail but try every single year so <laughs> i try again all right nancy brought up deer i was wondering when they were going to be brought up um a little bit later than i had expected but she's asking if they have eaten most of the understory will the plants come back if the deer population is being placed under control it depends on the how much of an impact they had um, a lot of these plants reproduce by rhizome so if these were you know if they were if they were munched down really hard then uh, and it had a, an effect on that rhizome then um, you know probably not of course there may be a seed bank left over that over time might be able to um, you know make a comeback but I don't know it with with my experience uh, you know hard deer browse has a lasting impact I would agree with that for sure. All right. Roxanne is asking, uh, do, do, do. it should be mentioned that we shouldn't forage from nature. Yes, we discussed that. If people want wildflowers, there are legitimate growers and sellers. Thank you, Roxanne. Um, Bill is asking, are there any GDD charts for wildflowers specifically as opposed to the OSU one, um, which appears to be larger flora? That's a great question, Bill. And that's, mm -hmm. um, I would love for for somebody to create that. <laughs> That's not something that I was able to find. Um, I was able to find some GDD charts that had um, more of a, some of our native woody species, but I wasn't able to find anything specific to to spring ephemerals. Um, you know, like we talked about during the presentation, the what OSU has created um, was driven by kind of the green industry, and what we're seeing is as far as ornamentals, um, but I don't know of one that's specific to spring ephemerals. That would be really cool, though. I agree. Uh, Barbara is asking, is there a comprehensive map that has layers to put plants, birds, and bees in seasonal relationships? Ooh. I don't know. I don't know of anything. No, not that I know of. I've been asked to do or, you know, to do some sort of like wildlife phenology type of talk, but I haven't put that together. I agree. That would be really cool to kind of yeah. wrap it all up to do on the to-do list. Yeah. <laughs> um, Richard's sharing that he's made May, May apple jam with very ripe fruits. Um, I'm just going to quickly share something that I find fascinating about May apples. Um, and maybe some of you have seen this before, but this is the white slant line moth. I'm sharing um, a blog from Jim McCormick. If you've not um, checked out his blog before, it's fantastic. Um, but anyways, these white slant line moths will kind of take shelter in May apple blossoms. There's not really any nectar there, but they're using it for camouflage purposes. So if you're out there looking for your May apples, take a peek for those moths. I have yet to find one, but I'm on the search. All right, uh, last question. Um, asking about the effects of invasive earthworms on rhizomes of wildflowers. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Definitely um, has, an, has, a, has an effect on, um, on those things that utilize the, the forest floor. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, I'm, a, I'm an agriculture and natural resources extension educator. So in terms of agriculture, um, you know, how earthworms are viewed is a totally different way than um, and, and, and more of a woodland setting. So, um, yeah, large populations of earthworms can definitely be detrimental to 
uh, to woodlands, I would say especially on our spring ephemerals, yeah. And I will add, um, there is an online nursery, American Meadows, I think it is, that has a whole section of woodland wildflowers that you can purchase. Bunch of different trilliums, Ooh. bunch of them that you've talked about here today. I have ordered from them before with, you know, it. you always wonder, is it the material you got or is it just that these things are so hard um, to grow that when you put them out, you know, your success rate is never 100%. And sometimes, like you said, with the trillium, the first year that I put some different trillium out, um, I didn't see anything. But two, three years later, I was walking in that part of the woods and boom, there's all these trillium that I was like, okay. <laughs> um, but it's one of the few catalogs that I've seen that has a specific section on woodland wildflowers. Um, doesn't make it the answer to everything, but I have picked um, especially on the trillium side, because it's a uh, trillium are hard plants to find with anybody trying to grow them. So a couple other great comments in the chat box. Um, let me scroll back up. So Judith shared Northeast pollinators covered ramps in their edible plants webinar this past Tuesday, and she attached the link. So scroll up to find that. Um, Clara is recommending Doug Tallamy book. Um, books, Living Landscapes. That's a great one. I agree. Uh, and then Becky mentioned that Jim McCormick is giving a free presentation at the Franklin Park Conservatory on April 1st on gardening for moths, probably related to his new book that just came out. I'm very excited for that one. And um, then there's a link to the Audubon Society. Thanks, Brad, for sharing that. Um, more information on plant and wildlife species selection. So Lots of great comments, Carrie. Again, excellent job. Um, I did post Jim McCormick's blog as well, so scroll up to find that. And Janice and Paul are talking about Prairie Moon and Prairie Nursery. So awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, I'm going to stop recording, Kathy, so you can share that SAF link. Okay. But thanks so much, everybody, for attending today.